Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we, your people, are gathered here today. We gather under the authority of your word, ready to submit, ready to turn our attention to you. We see the authority which is so implicit in your word and made manifest to us in your son. We ask now that you would take hold of my words and our minds, that it might expose our unbelieving hearts, our hard hearts, and replace them with great faith in Jesus our Savior. It's for his precious name's sake that we pray. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. If you haven't already, you can turn in the book of Matthew to uh, chapter 8. That's where we are today. We continue uh, in the sermon series in the book of Matthew. And it is my joy uh, to be here with you today again. And uh, not under the circumstances, right? Uh, It is a sad day, I know, but it is... Uh, good that I am able to be here to serve Asher and to serve you all uh, in the word. And so we turn now to this passage, a familiar passage to many of us. Uh, it's part of a, a, a slow burning fuse, if you were, running through Matthew's gospel, pointing to the divine authority of Jesus. Finally, we see this this fuse burn up at the end of chapter 28, in a passage you know very well where Jesus declares his authority and gives a commission. It's, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Think of that phrase, of all nations, because we're going to see that this morning, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, the emphasis this morning, much like last week, is not so much on the miracle itself. Now, don't get me wrong, the miracle is great, and um, it is astonishing, and it's amazing display of power over sickness as Jesus heals, and, and not this time in an up-close way like he has with the leper where he touches him or he heals him right there, but now he's doing it from a distance. What an amazing display of power, but it's not about the miracle itself. It's about the kind of faith that made Jesus marvel. It's the Jesus marveling kind of faith that's in contrast to the unfaithfulness of Israel. Now this fuse that I'm talking about, this this fuse of pointing to the authority of Jesus, it kind of really started burning Um, or got going faster at the end of chapter 7. Look at the end of chapter 7. Jesus has just finished the teachings that he's had, the Sermon on the Mount, if you were. When he finished saying these things, the crowds were what? Astonished. They were in awe at his teaching. They hadn't seen this before. He was teaching them as one who had what? Authority. He was teaching them not like their scribes, not like they had seen before. It's different. Man, this guy teaches in a way that is different and, um, and amazing. They were astonished at what he was saying. I wonder this morning, are you prone to questioning authority? Are you prone to, to wonder and, and see, is authority really good for me? Whose authority is good for me? If you are, then you are in good company uh, here this morning. For you see, from the very beginning, authority has been a major issue. You don't have to be shrewd to realize that there is a widespread crisis in the whole area of authority. Men and women abuse it. Men and women are confused by it. 
students ask, is there any final authority? Who is my authority? And sadly, yes, sadly, we see our nation constantly fighting over it. But it isn't just in the society around us. It isn't just something that we observe from a distance. No, the issue that we have with authority walks right into our families. It's in our schools. It affects us in our businesses. It wrecks our marriages and it undermines scripture in our churches. Our problem, friends, with authority reverberates all around us in everything that we are. And this is true educationally, politically, socially. It's true morally and it's true theologically. As Kevin was praying, he's mentioning and praying for parents in the raising of their children. It was about 13 years ago when I first uh, read Shepherding a Child's Heart. I'm not sure if you've read that book. Ted Tripp writes about what it means for parents to, uh, to point their kids to Jesus. How that their role isn't to own their children, but simply to be an under-shepherd of God's and to shepherd them and point them to who Jesus is. And I remember reading this, and the most influential part of the book, he gave lots of practical tips. Parents, if you haven't read that, you can pick up a book, uh, Shepherding a Child's Heart by Ted Tripp. I would encourage you to read it. But the most influential part for me is when he said that the number one thing that a child needs to learn by the time that they are five years old is that they are a person under authority. And you can see why, right? No matter what age you are, no matter what occupation you have, no matter how much money you have in your bank account right now, each and every one of us is a person under authority. And understanding and knowing and submitting to rightly understanding authority is essential for all of life and especially essential for what it means to be a Christian. If you're here with us today and you're not a Christian, at first, uh, on behalf of the church, I think I can do this, right? Uh, welcome. Welcome. We are glad that you are here. We know that there's no better place for you to be than sitting underneath God's word with his people. And I want you to know, too, that we struggle with authority. Each and every one of us, we struggle with this. But it means uh, when you're coming to Christ, what that means is that you would give your life, that you would submit to his authority. And that's what we're seeing. You see, God has established the world and everything in it, including you and me, to live under and find joy in his loving rule, his authority. We are created to delight in him as Lord and and to treasure him and to find comfort in his sovereign care over us. But instead, just like Adam, in our sin, we have all rejected God's authority. And apart from God's intervention... Apart from his saving work, we are all literally hell-bent on being our own own authority. Right, parents? You can see this in your youngest children when you lay them down for a nap and they arch their back and their face turns red. You don't have to teach anybody to reject authority. It's part of our sinful nature. It's part of what has caused all of the issues in the world around us. Our natural desire, you see, is to to look for authority. We want authority. And each of us concludes in our own hearts, this is why the Bible says that our hearts are deceitfully wicked, that we conclude that the greatest and best authority is within us. Thereby, we, we start to set up our own little kingdoms and set ourselves up as the source of all authority and establish ourselves as king and queen or governor or president. And friends, this lies our problem or our sickness, if you were. And this is the reason that Jesus came. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, that he came to destroy the works of the devil. The the uh, Undermining the authority of God 
kind of works. But if we were to stick with Matthew's gospel, Matthew puts it this way. Jesus said, Jesus said this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. He said, I have come not to, to call the righteous, but to call sinners. Matthew chapter 9. And so what we find in our text this morning, this, these miraculous hearing, um, healings that we are seeing here in chapter 8, they highlight for us this very act of Jesus coming for the sick. Jesus coming under authority and with authority to call those who know they are sinful, despised, and rejected. Now, if you were here last week, you remember the healing that Jesus gives to the, the leper. It goes to show Jesus' cleansing power over the physically unclean, right? It was an outward picture of an inward reality, a foretaste of what Jesus will do ultimately on the cross with the uncleanness in our lives. You see, each of us stands before Christ dirty and stained with the shame of sin. We all have things in our lives, right? Either the present or the past that make us feel untouchable, unclean, sins we've struggled with for years. I don't know what that is for you. Sins that we've struggled with for years, sins that others have committed against us that cause us to feel unloved and ashamed. And in and of ourselves, we are unclean, as Scripture would teach us, before a holy God. But the good news is that through Jesus' death on a cross, He takes the shame and the filth of our sin upon Himself in order to make us clean. Or as Ezekiel chapter 36 says, He removes our hard hearts and He gives us a heart of flesh. Removing the heart of stone cleansing us from all of our uncleannesses. This is what we see again today, not only, but this time, not only with an unclean Jew, but with an ethnically outcast Gentile. And not just uh, any Gentile, but a soldier. Look at verse 5. Let's look at it in detail. Here it is, Jesus walking into the town of Capernaum, which is believed to be his home base, right? Maybe he was going on furlough. He's been out. He's coming home to rest. He's got a group of people following him. And just as he gets into town, a centurion came forward to him. This is a lot of information right here. You can stop and just think about what it means for a centurion to come to him, a Jew. In other words, this wasn't just any soldier. No, it was a career serviceman. A man commanding hundreds of men. A man responsible for the discipline of the regiment. Centurions were the, the cement that would hold the whole battalion together. This centurion was a man who understood authority and a man who had the backing of Rome behind him. And This centurion was not only viewed as an ethnic outsider... And as a stranger by the people of God, to the promises of God, but he was also one who deliberately, or centurions were one who deliberately opposed the people of God. I think Charles Spurgeon said it this way, that he was Israel's oppressor. Can you see what's going on here in this scene? Do you see how these two things don't mesh together? In the culture, Jesus, a Jewish man, a rabbi, walking into this town, and this foreigner, this outsider, comes up to Jesus. That was unheard of. For they despised one another. Jews despised Roman presence there, and vice versa. But notice how he comes to Jesus. Notice what this stunning thing looks like. First, he comes with a great need or concern, just like the leper. It says, when he entered the town, a centurion came forward to him, appealing 
to him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering, suffering terribly. He comes with concern, not like the leper for himself, but for another, for his servant who has had some sort of bodily numbing illness. We don't know what that is, but he's sick. He's suffering. And I want us to take just a moment, and I don't want us to miss this. I want you to just look at this example of this centurion. What an example of human kindness. What an example of being in tune with others' pain and suffering. I wonder, do you know the pain and suffering of those around you? What about in your own family? The ones who are struggling what an example of what it means to weep with those who weep and an example of bearing with one another's burdens. Church, what an example of how we ought to pray. Bringing petitions before the Lord, interceding on behalf of one another, taking our concerns and our anxieties and our cares to the Lord, knowing that He cares for us. And not just for me, but for the person sitting next to you. A person sitting behind you, a person that you see at the gas station, taking concerns to the Lord. And not only that, but I hope for those of you that have employees, that you take note of this. Many of you in here have employees, people that you watch over or supervise, people that, who, that are under your charge, and I hope that you are asking yourself, Am I like this? Am I showing care and concern for those people that I am in charge of, especially with their health needs and their concerns? Now, there's no reason why this centurion should have been so concerned for his servant. Again, that wasn't the norm in the Roman Empire. Listen to what Aristotle said, talking about friendships that are possible in life. He writes... There can be no friendship nor justice towards inanimate things. Indeed, not even towards a horse or ox, nor yet towards a slave as a slave. For master and slave have nothing in common. Or likewise, Cato, a Roman writer on the topic of agriculture, would give advice that men should throw out an old and sick slave just like they would a used up farm tool. Get rid of them. That's what he should have been doing. But notice the extraordinary person. This, notice the extraordinary centurion. It's quite clear that he loved his servant. And perhaps it is his unusual and unexpected gentleness and love which just moved Jesus to compassion when he came to him. Brothers and sisters, Love always covers a multitude of sins. Love covers offenses. So let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God. Second, I want you to notice that he comes humbly recognizing Jesus' authority. He calls out, Lord. Twice he does this. And it's the same as the lepers, please, when he says Lord, meaning master or ruler. I'm submitting to you. That's the, that's the posture of his heart when he would come to Jesus and call out Lord. And again, this is not what you would expect from a man in his position. And yet, humbly, he comes and he pleads with Jesus. He begs Jesus. He urges Jesus to do something, to heal his servant. Friends, this is how we are to come to Jesus. Have you ever heard someone say, we need to have a come to Jesus moment? Well, that is every single moment for us. We come to Jesus with this kind of thing. And I'm not saying the first time. I'm not talking about walking an aisle and kneeling and this is the one time you come to Jesus. No, it's a, it's a daily occurrence when we come to Jesus 
we plead with him, we urge him. I like how Dane Ortland, I think uh, Asher highlighted it in his last week, uh, uh, Gentle and Lowly, this book that he writes, he says, and I'm going to change it up a little bit, he says, we come to Jesus when we're discouraged and frustrated, when we're weary and dischanted, when we're cynical, when we're empty. We come when we are running on fumes and feel like we are constantly running up a descending escalator. We come to Jesus thinking, how could I have messed up this bad again? It's on Sunday, no less. How can I come to him like this? We come to him when we feel that God must be disappointed in me. We come wondering, have I just shipwrecked my life? This is how we are to come. Like the centurion, friends, we are to come needy and we are to come humbly. You might be asking yourself, okay, I, I hear you. We are to come to Jesus. But what's going to happen when I come to him? And what is it going to look like when I bring my mess to Jesus, when I come forward like this, when I come vulnerable, because that's not, again, that's not our posture by our nature. It's to be naked and afraid and to be hidden and ashamed. And that's the work of the devil that Jesus came to destroy. That's what this place is to be about. We are to be a church, a people who can recognize that you can come broken. You've heard people say that churches should be a hospital for the sick. Maybe that's not your church experience. I think it's rare. It shouldn't be, but I think it is because we like to put on a good face. We like to come and act like we have it all together. Instead of coming like this man, needy and humbly to Jesus. But when we do, look what Jesus says in verse 7. I will come and heal him. I will come and heal him. The man didn't even get to ask him, Jesus, can you come, can you come do this? Perhaps that was implied, but Jesus didn't say, as he has done other places in the Gospels, what is it that you want me to do for you? I see you following me. What is it that you want from me? No, Jesus jumps right in, the, the leper got a chance to say, if you will, remember, which was, if you have the desire, the leper got the chance to do that, but instead, Jesus jumps right in, and he says, I'm in. He says, in other words, it's my joy, I'll do it, that's my thing, Jesus says, that's what, that's, that's what I love to do, I love to show grace, I love to show mercy, I love pardoning and relieving and comforting all of those who will come to me sick and weak and weary. Church, that's what Jesus is all about. He loves to come and heal. And I'm not saying that whatever you're going through, whatever sickness or physical thing that that God will heal you if you just come. That's up to him. He can do that if he wants, right? That's why the leper said, if you will. God, if your will is to heal me, then heal me. If not, we say like Job, I'm still going to worship you. I'm still going to serve you. I'm still going to love you. So here when Jesus says, I'm all in, I'll do it, he agrees, but the man says, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. He goes on to explain that I too am a man under authority, which I'm not going to speak a lot about this, but think about that. I too am a man under authority. He recognizes that Jesus is under the authority of someone else, God the Father. And Jesus, you can go read about it in John's gospel. I think it's in John chapter 5 where he talks about that he is under the authority of the Father. He doesn't do anything without the Father's permission. So Jesus is a man under authority. He says, I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. 
And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Like the crowds following Jesus, this centurion recognizes Jesus' authority, but unlike the crowds, he seems to understand it, and he bows a knee to it. He isn't chasing the show. He isn't on the miracle tour, if you were. He canceled the show. He said, Jesus, don't come. All you need to do is say the word. Your command carries all the power that is necessary. Now, we can stop here and do a whole sermon on the sufficiency of the word of God. That all he has to do is speak. Did you notice that in the text where he says, all you have to do is say it. But only say the word. Our God is that powerful. He doesn't need to display. You don't, friend, you don't have to throw your fleece out on the ground. But you believe in the word of God, that it is sufficient. That the word of God is enough. That when you open, you get alone with him and you open your, the Bible and you read the promises that says, I am I am for you and not against you. And you're like, well, yeah, but show me, God. Is that how we approach the word? I wonder, can you say with the centurion that you are confidently trusting in the word of God, God's promises? This is what Abraham experience and this is what we see in Genesis 15 when God makes a covenant with Abraham and it says that he believed God he didn't see immediately the results of his faith but he believed God and it was counted to him as what righteousness look at verse 10 as we continue verse 10 it goes on to say, when Jesus heard this, when he heard the man say, you don't need to come, all you need to do is speak. I understand what authority looks like. It says that Jesus marveled. And he said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I don't know if you underlined in your Bible, but I did in mine. Jesus marveled. He was amazed. This word here for marveled is the same word used in chapter 7 and throughout the rest of Matthew's gospel, but it's always pointed towards the crowd. The crowd was astonished. The crowd was amazed. The people saw. But this is the only time in Matthew's gospel that it says that Jesus was astonished. It's the only time where we see that Jesus was amazed at something. Jesus marvels. Jesus is amazed at the simple and humble, absolute trust for his authority and the power of his word. So much so that no one else among the Jewish people, including the disciples, had displayed up to this point. I don't want you to miss this. Did you see who he was talking to after he was amazed and marveled? It didn't, he didn't say this to Centurion. He turned and he looked to the followers, people that were chasing after him. And he says to those followers, those people that are coming after Jesus, he's teaching them that at this point, probably mostly Jews, he was teaching them what it really means to follow. You see, true followers, Jesus says, they don't chase me for my miracles but they follow me because I am worthy of their faith and devotion. He says, this is real faith. It's humbly relying on my word, my promises to get you into the kingdom, to bring you to the table. That's why he uses the example. Look at it in verses 11 through 12. He says, I tell you, many will come from east and west from all over, right? Does that sound like Matthew chapter 28 where he says, go and make disciples of what? All nations from the east and from the west. They will come and they will recline at table. How fitting that we're having the Lord's Supper today. They'll come to the table. They will recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven while the sons of the kingdom will be 
thrown into outer darkness in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Real faith is bringing you into the kingdom kind of faith, sitting at the table kind of faith. The Jews longed for and looked for with anticipation the day when the Messiah would come and hold a great feast, a banquet if you were, hence this reclining at the table language, but it never for a moment crossed their minds that any Gentile would ever sit down at that table. It never for a moment crossed their minds that Jesus would invite sinners to the table. And this is why Jesus' words were so astonishing and shocking to Matthew's Jewish audience. Jesus is essentially saying that to those who follow him, that their Jewishness didn't guarantee them anything in heaven. That their Jewishness, their heritage, their good works, their righteousness doesn't get them anywhere. It is only by faith that you are welcome to the table of the Lord. Praise God that he welcomes sinners. Praise God that he welcomes Gentiles, those who are aliens and strangers and foreigners to the promises of God. The Bible tells us in Galatians that the true people of God, the true seed of Abraham are those who come by faith. Friends, the only thing that mattered was whether or not they have faith. And the same thing applies to every one of us today. Our eternal destiny, whether thrown into outer darkness or welcome to the table, is dependent on how we come to Jesus and what we do with this trusting, humbly trusting, putting our faith in the person and work of Jesus to save us from our sins and to rule over us as the Lord of our life. Maybe you've never come to Jesus. Put your trust in him. I urge you. I plead with you and appeal with you like this man did. Come to Jesus and put your hope in him and you will be saved. In verse 13 It says that Jesus gladly healed the centurion's servant. Immediately. At a very moment. When he believed the man was healed. And for you too. The moment you place your trust in Jesus. Immediately your sins will be forgiven. You will be healed. I'm not talking about from whatever illness you have in this life, we still have the fallen effects of sin. But in your heart, your, the way God sees you, He will see you as perfect and spotless and blameless in a moment. He's not going to say to you, you got to go get yourself clean and then come back and show yourself to me. In a moment, He will heal and you will be saved. And then he will say to us, to each and every one of us who humbly come, needy, he will say, though you are sinful and flawed, you are welcome and loved at my table. Let's pray. Lord, there is no way that we could come and recline at the table on our own works, our own merits. There's no way that we can partake of all that you are for us, your perfect life, your death on a Roman cross, your glorious resurrection. We can't partake in any of those things unless you give us faith. And we ask now, Lord, that you increase that in your people. Thank you 
for, for giving us great faith. Lord, I pray for those today who don't know you, that you would draw them to yourself. And Lord, I pray that as we come to the table, that you would restore our soul. That you would restore to us the joy of salvation. And that we would come needy and humbly. Because you are a God who saves, who forgives. Thank you. It's in the precious name of Jesus.